Welcome to the conversation. I'm Paul Grandal, the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. Very uh, pleased and excited about our guest today, Dr. Kelly Wisman. She's a faculty member at the University at Albany and the director of the Capital District Writing Project and Amy Salamone, who is a English professor at Gilder, English teacher at Gilderland High School and a, a longtime member, facilitator, institute uh, participant at the uh, Capital District Writing Project, their summer institute, where they're normally on the campus at UAlbany. I know things will be different as they are everywhere uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, but welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So maybe Dr. Wisman, we we'll start with you. Um, what, what was the history of the Capital District Writing Project and how did UAlbany connect with all these teachers in our region? Sure, thank you so much again for this opportunity. Um, so the Capital District Writing Project is the site of the National Writing Project, which began in 1974 um, in Berkeley, California. Really from the belief that all teachers are teachers of writing, that writing has a critical role to play in a participatory democracy. And with everything happening in the world today, we believe that's even more true now. Um, and that teachers can and should be leaders of educational reform. So we've always had this sort of um, forward-looking uh, aspect to our work together and, and true partnerships we try to um, create between K-12 uh, schools and universities. So we're really learning with and from each other um, in that way. So um, in 2004, we sort of revived um, the writing project site here at UAlbany. And then I came on in 2017 um, as, as the director, along with um, the leadership of Amy Salamone and Chris Mazura and Christina Pep. And as you mentioned, we do um, a yearly summer institute for teachers. We're moving it online for the first time in our history. Um, this, this summer, we have young writers workshops also going on. On. And we did um, this past spring do a number of uh, events in response to COVID-19 in order to support our teachers and um, teaching and learning and navigating the world that they and their students were, were traveling. So that's a little bit of our history. Thank you. So full disclosure, Amy, my daughter Caroline was one of your students and you were her all-time favorite teacher. I, and, I, and I know you and, and also your colleague Mitch Hahn had a great impact on my daughter and her friends. And I, I've been the beneficiary of great teachers throughout my life. And it, it, it's so important and amazing how a teacher can touch a young person's life. And I know she still keeps in touch with you, which I love. Um, so what's it been like for you as a high school teacher you know, especially coming down to the end of the year has been a very challenging year. How have you been able to maintain the remote learning and, and the connection to your students? Well, I think it's been really challenging because I think that, um, you know, my whole practice has been really based on my relationships with, with, with my students. So thank goodness we had that going into the quarantine, right? So I felt like my students were already with me by March, fortunately. And I think um, that's how many of us feel that we could sustain some of what we had built because we had started in September to build those relationships and to build community. But it's super hard. I'm sure you have experienced this yourself. Um, and so I'm so grateful for the writing project because we were, we've been able to support each other in our work, but also just for the record, the practices that I, the really the rich practices of writing instruction that I've learned in the writing project, in, it enabled me to continue with my students. Like we have a daily writing practice, they're writing every day, they're sharing their writing with me and maybe each other, I, I'm not sure. And I think um, in many ways documenting this moment. So I feel blessed to be in a community of educators where there are practices established that allowed us to go into remote learning with some some real connectors in place for us and um, i think it's really hard i don't like it i still want to be able to see people's faces and and you know I, touch them if i need to you know like reach out and touch hold my put my hand on a shoulder and say we can get through this but i still feel like um we've done a pretty good job and I, I think my school district frankly i think gilderland has done a really good job at really trying to privilege what's so important in this moment 
and just support us in doing the best that we can. But nothing, nothing could show me more how important those human relationships are, right? Right. Face-to-face -face human relationships, that that's where learning and growth and humanity are born. So I, I really hope we can get back there, you know? Right. I, I teach a freshman writing workshop at, at the Writers Institute. I'm, I'm not teaching this semester, but I've kept in touch with our students. And I found, you know, it, it's challenging. A lot of them are in a household with one computer, not great internet connection, uh, four or five people trying to use the same computer, distracted, certainly, you know, distraught over what's going on on, on multiple levels in the world. How do you uh, I'll pose this to you, Kelly. Um, I mean, how do you support and, and sort of try to help teachers who are stressed, who are teaching students who are stressed, whose parents are stressed? I mean, how do you try to help that? You're so right. It's such a multi-layered, multi-dimensional uh, issue of, of, of teaching and learning access and equity, um, the emotional terrain that people are, are traveling as well as um, just civically as well, I think, with the, the social unrest and everything that um, we're seeing now, although we should have been seeing it much longer, um, racial injustice in our country. And so, um, as Amy suggested, I think we just keep trying to build relationships um, to really center writing and all that we do when our members come together, create, and what we, we've called it holding space. It's holding space to be Sometimes we need to be quiet. Sometimes we need to just write together and not share, but just know that other people are writing and with us um, in this endeavor. But we are really trying to make our way. But I, I think as Amy suggested, the National Writing Project has provided so many incredible protocols and processes for us to um, utilize. And they're, they're very, they seem very basic when you first look at them, but just to be able to give a, a small, a, you know, really generative writing prompt, time to write, time to hold space, protected space for teachers to write, and then to share with each other. It's, it's incredibly powerful and incredibly moving. Is this group also, sort of a support group and I'll ask Amy like what is the level do you think of of just I don't know stress despondency things among teachers I mean when you talk among yourselves without giving oh. any personal away but I, I assume yeah, teachers yeah. must just be really wanting to vent with each other I would say I would say I think because we were so unprepared which is a lesson that we're learning right we were unprepared to move to virtual all at once. And, and that's a good lesson for us to learn and also unprepared for all the inequities that would start to surface, even though, like Kelly said, we, we probably should have been more aware of those. Uh, that's all good for us. But I think the stress level is, has been super high because I think that, as you know, you know, you mentioned someone like a Mitch Han, people completely committed to their students and their work that in this moment, feeling like they, they can't meet their students' needs and, and we don't know what's going on in people's homes, right? We don't really know all the layers once kids, um, you know, sort of go virtual. Uh, I think it's been incredibly stressful. And I think what the writing project does, and I would like to just compliment Kelly. I mean, Kelly has been one of the greatest supporters of K-12 teachers I've ever met out of the university, Paul, like someone totally dedicated. And she was the one who said, I, I think we need to support teachers. I think we need to create space for teachers. I think we need to talk about George Floyd's murder. I think we need to provide a place for teachers to meet, to sort of figure things out together. And I would say that's my experience. While I think there's venting, I also think there's a lot of creative genius going on too and, and problem solving. So it's not just, it's a place where people can say, I'm scared, I'm struggling. Um, what can I do better? How can I be a better teacher? And so I find it completely inspiring to meet these teachers that are, despite their own levels, you know, maybe their own stressors in their own homes, trying to yeah. deal with their own children and their own things that are to remain totally committed to their, their students and what's going on. So I think it's a balance between um, sort of having a place to say, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about what's happening and what I'm doing in my virtual classroom and also doing creative genius work, if I can call it that, just amazing things happening. And I think the Writing Project is that fertile soil. So it's not just a place to say, I'm struggling. We can hold that space, but we can also say, and how do we raise each other up and, and raise our students up? And so that's such a great piece of it. Right. Have you seen any 
really sort of amazing examples um, of, of students doing better work remotely than they have. Because I have a friend who's a is a uh, counselor and he works with a lot of students and families. He was telling me a story again without giving any identifying information of a of a young student who's on the spectrum and does not feel he feels bullied when he's in the actual class and he feels like a total outsider but he's always been this kid who's really good on technology and he said like finally this is my moment he he, he said like he he is like off the charts uh tracking upward during this time you have examples of that oh, absolutely better Absolutely. Those kids that you're describing that are often, um, the classroom is overwhelming to them and just the school, all the people. I've seen kids flourish in this setting. They can have the avatar and they talk more because they have the avatar to protect them. I would say I have some mixed feelings about that, but I also feel like for as many kids as I've seen struggle, I've also seen kids feel like this is a home for them. And so I have kids talking about hybrids going back, that we have opportunities for kids to work in different spaces that maybe work better for some of them. Not all the time, right? Because we want to encourage social interaction with our kids. And But um, I, I think kids are coming up with some really creative ideas about what school could look like moving forward, having this experience. Right. So Kelly, I know you're an academic, you do a lot of research. This must be a time since it's so unprecedented that researchers like you are, are studying and, and taking, you know, metrics and analysis of this. Are you finding any preliminary things that interest you that you're going to study further going forward? Or? Sure, yeah. Um, I think um, I could give an example of uh, of a uh, research proposal that Amy's been intimately involved in, in helping us craft that um, we would really like to study what happens when a very diverse coalition of stakeholders comes together and starts to reimagine what education could be, um, given the experiences that we've been having over these past um, eight or nine weeks or maybe more. And so I think um, the work involved in um, making that um, proposal, one of the things that was important to us was to stay true to our identities and to our values related to writing as, as a core practice um, in, in a participatory democracy. But at the same time, we have really rich resources at the School of Education at the University at Albany that have been an incredible support for the work that we do. Um, really amazing thinkers who look at systems change and systems change theory. And so what we are proposing to do um, is to bring those two worlds together in a way that often aren't brought together. The, court, the sort of more narrative storytelling work that I tend to do in, in my research um, as a qualitative uh, researcher of, of the arts and literacies. And, bring it together with folks who really look um, at a systems level about how we can leverage these stories and experiences to really make a change in the educational system. So I'm really looking forward to pursuing, pursuing that work. And so thank you for that question. Um, thank you. Uh, and Amy, obviously the coronavirus pandemic and being quarantined, certainly students, as you mentioned, would want to write about that. But I want to ask about the George Floyd killing and the long list of, of uh, unarmed black people being killed and, and this week and 10 days or more of, of mass protests. Are you, you know, since you have a diverse class and, and, and student population, are you having discussions on that? Does it feel safe to talk about, you know, re really raw and sensitive issues with a, with a culturally and, and ethnically diverse group? I would say for me, yes, but I, I would say for many people, it's probably hard. This format is difficult, right? I mean, it's hard to talk about race anyway, right. even if you're in the room, but um, online, it's even harder because I can't see kids' reactions, that discomfort, but my students already know, like we're gonna write first and then we're gonna talk. And um, we already have that established practice and they know that I'm not a teacher that will ignore the world that we're living in. So we did write about it. We have spoken about it. Kids are doing a lot of thinking about it. And, you know, it's a lot of diverse thinking, like the kid that says, well, my father's a police officer and not all police officers are bad. And, you know, my thing is, 
and you know this, Paul, like how do we talk to each other? How do we find our way into conversation that will move this forward instead of keep us where we've been for so long? And the one thing that I love about the grant that Kelly is talking about is it privileges student voices in the conversation. And I think we need to find ways to let our students talk to us more about what they're thinking, what they see as the vision for the future. And I think also we need to keep working as teachers. Like, how do we have these hard conversations? What should the curriculum really be in September? You know, like what it's time to kind of review what we've been doing, because don't you think it hasn't really been working? You know, I mean, I feel like what, you know, what's, what's going on? What are we doing in schools where we, we're in some of the same places we've been for over 50 years? And I think, you know, our project yesterday just had a holding space for writing and thinking and quiet around the murder of George Floyd. And I think it was at the same time as the memorial service was happening. And I thought, this is just beautiful. And we're in that conversation with each other. How do we help ourselves as educators have these really hard conversations? And um, what is that going to look like moving forward? But yes, my um, students were right there, ready to go, ready to talk, and they want to talk. Yeah, of course. We, we do a, a literary journal called Trolley at the Writers Institute, and this upcoming issue is going to be on, you know, we close it out before the start of the protest, but on the coronavirus pandemic. And we had like three times the amount of submissions, students, faculty, community, a lot of community people. So people feel like they, they, they're in this moment that's unprecedented. They want to respond to it, react to it, express themselves. Uh, what are you seeing um, with college students, university students, Kelly? Are you seeing similar to what Amy's seeing with high school students? Or? I am. I am to a certain degree. I have to say I I'm, was on sabbatical this past spring, so I wasn't sort of as intimately involved um, as my colleagues were who needed to you know, change everything mid-semester and, and be there for students, many of whom had multiple people in their families affected by COVID-19 and lost them. And so it has very much, um, you know, caused us as, as faculty, to, as faculty and college professors to really step back and, and sort of ask the questions that Amy's asking, like, what are we really doing here? And where are we being supportive? And what are the texts that we're assigning? And what is going to be meaningful to them in this time? And I think this, what you're noticing, Paul, about that rise in um, uh, of submissions I feel it too um, in in thinking through the work of, of the of the writing project that the the amount of programming that we did this past spring is really unprecedented for us. We were we we sponsored a six to seven week series where we we met and we had an incredible amount of people who participated, not just in the events themselves from all over the state, really, um, but also the amount of our teacher leaders who co-facilitated those with us. And so um, we just saw the depth and the breadth of the talent and the expertise and what Amy calls the creative genius of our teachers. And it's been as exhausting as it was, just invigorating um, to see how much people want to use writing as the place to work out their ideas and to be with each other and to um, try to affect change and we, we, we see we're still seeing it as powerful and as painful as yesterday's gathering was um, in response to the murder of George Floyd um, it was absolutely necessary absolutely vital and as a community as a k-12 community in partnership with the university I can't think of anything else we should have been doing. There's more to do, obviously, but we needed to come together and we needed to write. And I think from there, we, we begin to, to grow and to realize what are our next steps together. Great. And can you talk about one, one of your, your big culminating events for the year is in the summer and normally sure. around the University at Albany campus with students and teachers and so what will it look like this summer? Uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot different. <laughs> it's going to be a lot different, but um, we're committed to seeing it through. Um, it's been a little challenge, as, as you might know, Paul, with um, all the things that are happening at the university with being shut down 
there's right. a lot of things that are shut down, not just the um, not just the buildings. And so trying to navigate that has been um, has been challenging, but we were committed to doing it. And so we'll have a two week summer institute uh, for teachers coming up in July, and um, we also have a week of uh, workshops for kids as well um, um, in the summer. And we're off actually offering three separate workshops for kids. And I might ask Amy to speak a little bit uh, to those um, and how we're running those. But I'll just say that the first one is called Writing Like an Artist. And that's gonna be for um, elementary uh, school kids. And so they'll be using picture books and different types of, of, of art and art projects to explore the creative dimensions of writing. The second one is uh, workshop sort of back by popular demand. It's one that we offered last summer called Create Your Own World. Um, and so kids create um, um, through writing and also through 3D models, fictionalized depictions of, of different worlds. And Amy can speak to in a second, I think, how amazing th those projects were last year. And I can't even imagine how more amazing they'll be this year with everything that kids are thinking about with the, sh the state of the world. And then finally, we'll have a workshop called um, creative writing for the college essay. And that all of these are, are taught by incredibly talented, experienced writing project teachers who just bring their love of writing um, to their development and facilitation of these, um, of these workshops. But we did think it was, it was not an easy decision uh, to come to in terms of do we offer these online because as Amy mentioned, relationships are so important and we have not met the, many of these kids that will be have will be signing up. So I wondered, Amy, would you mind speaking a little bit to those Young Writers Workshops and our thinking related to that? <laughs> well, I think we, I mean, we did, we do a lot of talking, Paul, like processing, like, what do we think? And I think we decided as a group that we would offer them and we'll see if kids sign up. But like kids, I think, are want these things, right? I think kids want to um, come together and work together. In fact, I don't know if you remember, but one of the kids who did the Create Your Own World presented, she read a piece at the Writers Institute in the fall. I mean, she's gonna change the world by herself. She's amazing. Right. And we have kids like that in the Capital District and they want those creative outlets. And the teachers were so willing to go with it and continue, even though they're probably exhausted working online, just to be with kids and writing and creating together. And so while I think um, for both our projects this summer, it will be new to us, people were so committed to doing the work. and. I think there'll be kids that really want to be creating this summer because I think this is a moment, right, for creating and, cre and creating with others. And so we'll learn a lot, but I'm so glad that we're doing it. I'm so glad we have teachers that want to continue to do this work and we'll, we'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, I like the, the phrase, the creative genius of, of teachers. Yes. You know? It's amazing. It, it's really great to see that commitment too. Um, yes. So let's talk about You've got an event coming up Monday. It's been a long, challenging semester. People are tired. It's been, you know, completely uh, emotionally shattering and every other way. But what are you going to do Monday? Something to sort of relieve stress and get people yes. talk about it. Yoga and writing. And we have three amazing teachers um, in our project who are going to offer a yoga pose, a poem, and a prompt for writing. Nice. And there's also going to be a place to record some, some things as um, so record some writing if people want to in those moments. And so it'll be, it's sort of, it's sort of interesting. I've been thinking a lot about the breathing, right? Breathing, breathing in the time of COVID, in the time of George Floyd. And so there'll be time for breathing together, posing, poetry, and writing. And I, we think that, I mean, it's just amazing the, the, uh, the way that three there are three women. The three women have thought about what pose they want to offer, the poem they want to offer, and the prompt. And they're just beautiful. And um, we'll see how it goes. I mean, we don't know how it's going to go to do a yoga pose on virtual, you know? But we have such a loving group. We have such a great group that's been with us for the last seven weeks. We think it'll be great. And so we sort of wanted to offer that contemplative but joyful in your body, in your spirit, in your soul, in your heart moment. And just breathe together and, um, you know, think about, think about that, right? right? Just think about what it means in this moment to be able to breathe and breathe together 
and write together and move together. And I think it's going to be amazing. They've been, every session, Paul, has been so wonderful. That was great. And it was just one of those things. We just started doing it and it kind of took on a life of its own. It was so generative and, uh, yeah, and generous. So I think it'll be wonderful. I like when, when some of the Capital District Writing Project comes to campus, including at the book festival and does some writing. How does being a teacher and working with students make you a better writer? I mean, I think of Frank McCourt, the classic, you know, he, he taught high school forever. And his students kept saying, you tell us these great stories. Now you better go write your book. And, and, and they actually inspired him to write Angela's yeah. Ashes, which is an amazing, amazing book. But what, what do you get from the students that, that help you be a better writer on your own? Well, I just have to say, uh, I'm not a, the best person to ask. I don't necessarily think I demonstrate the writers we have among us. Like, I think I sent you a piece that Alicia Wine wrote yes. just about the, you know, pre-COVID, what it was like to teach, where you now have to think about an active shooter right. coming into your building. And we have, so, I think that um, the teachers in the writing project who write with their students, uh, all, all of us, are just better writers because our students are amazing writers, right? So we yeah. get to see, we get to struggle in the muck with them about writing those first drafts and revision and getting to the heart of what it is we really wanna say. So I think if we're committed to that work, I think most of us are, we can see like, I've just been working on a poem about breathing because of what I've been, been experiencing with my colleagues. And I would say I don't, write unless I'm with the writing project or with my students. So it's given me the opportunity to do some of my own writing. And again, it just makes me a better teacher, right? When I'm in my own, I'm sure you, you know, as a writer, to me, you both are real writers. I'm the, the student, but um, I just think it makes us all better writers and able to really think about the power of words and what they mean and how we use them. Right. Right. Um, I put a little thing out on Twitter yesterday. I read a Wall Street Journal article on a single space or double space after a sentence. It's a typographical space war, they called it. I know. I and I have that. never gotten more responses. And, and, and I, I wanted to ask both of you as, as teachers and, and academics, and then it got into an Oxford comma. So it actually gave me great hope that people really care about writing and the mechanics and everything. So first of all, putting you on the spot, are you a one spacer or a two spacer? And how do you stand on the Oxford comma? We'll start with Kelly. So I'm having a little noise outside of my, my building. I'm sorry about that, but um, I definitely was trained in the, in the two space um, after the period and I, it's a very hard habit for me to break um, even though I know I'm supposed to do one. Um, I, I love commas. I'm gonna mute. So. Okay. Amy, where do you come in on that? Uh, well, I'm old so I'm the two-spacer. Same here. I was yeah. put my place. Yeah. But I have to say, Paul, to be frank, um, when kids are writing, I don't care. Yeah. You know, I want them to be writing first and, and but I do think, one thing Kelly has really taught me is is what does a what does polish look like or what does that professional final piece look like and i think that's also a good conversation to have with students as well and i think in this moment when they're out there they might even be on the street by your house kelly i think yes. maybe. you know when they're out and when they want to say here please listen to me i think at some point we want to talk with them about what does that piece look like maybe not in a street protest but in their writing and in their speaking because it does give them the leverage that we want them to have when they're you know, talking to Cuomo or whomever they're speaking to. So yeah, I'm a two spacer and I like commas as well. <laughs> I, as, as a journalist, we were the, the uh, Oxford comma was drummed out of us. That's, that's not a uh, journalistic sort of casual reference. If I'm doing a, you know, term paper or something like that, I was the Oxford comma, but I was a two spacer and now all the people are jumping on me like, you're old, you're, you're 30, 20 years out of date. So and, and I just found out every now and then when I submit something, people go in the editors and, and put my two to one space and I didn't even notice it. And it's like, but old habits do die hard. Yes, yes um, they do. So I guess, I guess finally talk about in, in this grant you're working on, you know, may, may be related to that. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the, the, the huge cuts coming for municipalities, for colleges and universities, for school districts, for, how can you keep this capital district writing project going in a time of 
of certain austerity and, and maybe much worse. Is this what the grant is trying to kind of sustain this? And, and how do you, can you, you need some kind of budget, I assume. Can you go with, with no money? Because right now our university, as you know, Kelly, is locked down. I couldn't buy a paper clip today if I wanted to. You know, right. we're all at home. We are all have no access to any funding. Um, so just, just talk in general how you fund it. And, and if people want to support it, how can they support it? Sure, thank you so much. Yes, we've been frozen this spring and, and into this summer, um, but it hasn't, hasn't stopped our work. Um, and, but as you, as you know, we do, we do have questions about how sustainable that can be. Um, we are a loving, we are a committed, we are a um, you know, very vibrant organization, but we are still people and we still need um, some, of, some of the supports that um, universities and funders and um, foundations can provide. So part of the, you know, the impulse, to, I've been doing a lot of grant writing and a lot of it is, is very much inspired by, by this moment and wanting to rise to the moment and wanting our teachers to have, and their students to have a voice in how we move forward as, as a country. Um, but at the same time, it's motivate, made of, motivated by not knowing if there will be funding uh, in the future. So um, we do have a scholarship fund for our young writers workshops. Um, and so I would encourage people to um, contribute to those if they can. You would help a young person in the capital region be able to attend one of our, our one week workshops this summer. That would be um, very much appreciated to be able to expand our reach to more more young people um, and reach out to us if there are other ways that you feel like you want to contribute either monetarily or through being a guest speaker or co-hosting events um, we we are committed to to thriving and and to um, contributing to the broader capital region in whatever way we can with whatever kinds of supports we can we can muster. Yeah, that's great. So we'll, we'll include the link to uh, the University of Albany website with the Capital District Writing Project. Is that where people should go to find out if they want to make a donation or more information? Absolutely. And we do have a special link just to contribute to the scholarship fund. So I'm happy to provide that to you as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you want to email me that, that would be great. Um, anything you want to conclude with, Amy? Uh, you know, I mean... I, I just wanted to... What's I, that? I wanted to tell you one funny thing. So, you know, I have this writing practice with my students. And in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, when we were home, I would give them these prompts, you know, like uh, they were just kind of silly prompts. I don't know what they were. I would always offer a prompt. And finally, they're like, look, can we just write about the pandemic? And I said, yes, you can. So I just thought, I just think it's so funny how even in my teacher world, I'm like, but this is my prompt. You know, I was, I needed them to still guide me. And I just think our students, which again, I want to say are privileged in this, in this grant that we're hoping we get, they have so much to teach us. And I, I just hope that we're open in this moment to really hearing what our young people are telling us about what they need in their world. And I, I hope we can listen to people like Caroline better. You know, and I, I'm just grateful that you are here talking with us. Thank you. And and um, as a parent, you know, our daughter Caroline is now 25. She graduated seven years ago, but she still talks about your classes, Amy, and the books you read and what she wrote in that class. And I know she keeps in contact with you. So that's that's what great teachers can be. I, I still keep in touch with some of my professors from undergraduate and graduate school. It's just a great gift. So. Yeah. We're really grateful to Amy Salamone, a English teacher at Gilderland High School and a facilitator and member of the Capital District Writing Project, Dr. Kelly Wisman, a University of Albany professor and director of the Capital District Writing Project. Thank you so much for being on the conversation. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.